uh, this is uh, Mark Schneider from uh, Vermont Energy Audits um, that we're interviewing today. He, uh, your BPI certified Building Performance Institute, Institute uh, certified certified Home Energy Auditor and uh, Efficiency Vermont certified Home Energy Auditor, and here to talk about Mark's transformation, wonderful transformation of his. Uh, Greensboro Bend uh, train depot to, into a wonderful, uh, warm, cozy, energy efficient home. So take it over, Mark. So when we moved up here in 2000, there was just a round oak wood stove. And I thought I knew cold weather. I used to teach outdoor survival and I, I was so wrong about knowing anything. So about that. So we moved up. It was virtually impossible to heat the building. Um, as it turns out, there was no insulation. So for three years, we heated it with this round oak. And we built a platform bed here because the only place at all warm was next to the wood stove. And the platform bed had to be like four feet off the ground. I built it so that that's where the warmth was. For three years, Denise and I vowed that we would never live here again in the winter. Right over here where Kevin's standing, I put down a glass of water one night and in the morning was frozen. It was a little colder 20 years ago. In other words, we had more 40 below weather that I've, than I've seen recently. Um, but nevertheless, this place was cold. We couldn't heat it with 11 cords. And I moved up here as a high-end builder from Mass. So I thought I knew a thing or two, but it turns out I didn't know anything because what we used to do is just build high quality houses and we didn't think about air sealing. It wasn't discussed. I don't even think it was understood or known about. So all we do is I tell the insulation guy to make it pink and then my furnace, the heating contractor would come up to me and he'd be like, we need more furnaces. So I'd be like, just add another furnace to this big house. So that was our solution. Then I came up here and my dad was a builder too and he was smart. But for the life of us, we couldn't figure out why we couldn't heat the building. So one thing we did is we had my little sister insulate the floor with fiberglass, which as an energy auditor, I see a lot. And nothing happened except we had to pay for the fiberglass, pay for my sister, could do a beautiful job underneath the crawl space. So then we're like, okay, we're the furnace guy. We had a furnace put in. He's like, call up this guy in Hardwick. He'll insulate the ceiling. This place will be warm. So we called up the guy from Hardwick. He insulated the ceiling. Nothing happened. So we got the floor insulated. Nothing happened. Ceiling, that was another 2,500, whatever. Nothing happened. They call that the fool's tax. You move up here and you don't know what you're talking about, what you think you do. You have to pay this penalty. So three years, we couldn't stand it. It was terrible, but we persisted. So it wasn't until seven years ago that my brother, I think it was seven, eight years ago, my brother told me of this free grant funded um, program from the federal government that would send you back to school. Hey, here's the, our ringleader for the energy committee. So after I went to school, I realized that it wasn't all about insulation, that it was equal parts of what they call air sealing. So if you picture insulation as a wool sweater, that's one thing. But if we're hiking and all of a sudden the wind blows, it's going to blow right through the, the wool sweater and you're going to be cold. So if we were hiking and the wind was blowing, we'd want to put a windbreaker on. So what we figured out was the windbreaker, which is air sealing, was more important than the sweater, which is the insulation. In fact, the longer we go down this building science road, they're realizing that if you put more energy into air sealing, you can put in less insulation. So I got grant funded. I p somehow passed because it was hard after 25 years of not being in school. Um, 
and I immediately knew why the insulation in the floor didn't work and why the insulation in the attic didn't work. That was because we had left out the air sealing component. So as soon as I finished the classes, I went out and I bought a foam gun and it got my caulking gun out. I started to seal every single crack in this building. When I sealed every single crack, sealed the basement, sealed the attic hatch, put storm windows in, all of a sudden I corralled the heat that we were generating with this unwieldy wood stove which has now been replaced. And we were able to actually heat the building and the heat that we generated actually stayed in the building. So we went from 11 cords, literally couldn't put enough wood into it to heat it, to about three cords, and then I switched out the wood stove and put this used yodel in, and that's down to more like two and a half cords. The component that we didn't understand, the component that we're starting to understand, is air sealing. Air sealing trumps insulation. So as soon as I fixed this building, the light came on my head that this was a really good business to be in, which is an energy auditor. And basically all an energy auditor does is walks around and looks at thermal boundaries, which are the walls to the outside, and figures out if they're air sealed through the use of a blower door. Then we have people spend hard-earned money on air sealing, and then they spend hard-earned money on insulation. But once they accomplish those two things in that order, their houses hold heat. That's why this held heat. So the other part of that is, Denise and I never realized how you could be comfortable in a house, this house. We didn't think it was possible. I was a high-end builder. I had no idea, right? I keep repeating that. So once we did that, the work to this house, um, I started auditing on my own. I love smart people. So I audited this very smart person in Greensboro, and he's like, why aren't you with Efficiency Vermont? I said, because I'm not a joiner. I don't like groups. <laughs> he's like, Mark, there's way more pluses than minuses. I'll never forget that, to joining Efficiency Vermont. So as soon as he said that, I'm like, wow, this guy's way smarter than I'll ever be. He's right. So then I joined Efficiency Vermont, and with that, um, got me all of their information and all their wisdom. And then the rest is history. So after I did this, I realized that any house could be fixed. I used this as an example, and then I went around. Um, I've been running around for the last eight years, air sealing houses, insulating them. But there's one important factor in that, which I didn't mention. There's an expression of, oh, the house is too tight. One afternoon, I actually got into it with some person up at Willie's in line who said that. And I'm like, I've had enough of this. There's no such thing as too tight. It needs to be ventilated right. This year at the Better Building by Design, which are those posters in the back there, um, they pointed out that it's even worse than that. It's, you need to ventilate the house right then you need to make it tight. And if you look at it like that, then there's no reason, no way in God's green earth that a building could be quote unquote too tight. The German standard zero air movement and they have robust ventilation systems. So of course, if the house is like an airtight box, we better move stale air out and we better allow fresh air in. So there's different strategies for ventilation. One is what this has. As soon as I made it tight, air sealed it, it held heat, but all of a sudden my windows were fogged up. When you see condensate on windows, that's a red flag that you have a problem. They're finding out that indoor air quality, bad indoor air quality, is worse than smoking cigarettes, which should make everyone in this room just startled. They did a study in Washington, D.C. with a program. Kids were getting asthma bad. It was costing like $30,000 to get the kid 
fixed up in the hospital from the asthma. They said, well, if that's the case, why is it happening? So they started a program, cost about $8,000 to fix a house that's not ventilated right and air seal it. So they're like, why don't we fix up the houses? Then the kids don't go to the hospital. So there's a net $22,000 savings by ventilating houses correctly. And if you think about it, we're all gotten lazy for the most part, maybe not the people in this room. We sit, we look at our computers, we don't want to leave the house, we eat junk food. Um, our houses are glass boxes basically with maybe some hodgepodge ventilation, probably not. Dogs, dogs equal two humans. You put it all together, it's like we live this very unhealthy lifestyle. So the answer is to put the computer down, go outside for a walk, do some exercise, get some ventilation, work on air sealing, we'll save money, we'll make the planet better, and everyone will be healthy. It's too easy. So my ventilation strategy was to punch holes in the walls, and I have, bath I have fans in the walls that, depending upon if I'm here or not, or if it's summertime or winter, I'll just run the fans. That's negative ventilation because it makes the building negative. It relies on cracks and gaps to make up air. That's how the fresh air moves to this building. In fact, I have so many people here, we're going to overheat the building and I'm going to have to put the fans on. And I'll, do, I'll show you how that works. The other strategy, which Dylan Kinsey had at his house last week, which we put in um, Denise's house in Craftsbury, is um, called balanced ventilation. And that is where you're drawing out 20 cubic feet per minute, and then you bring 20 cubic feet per minute in. If you go into houses with balanced ventilation like Dylan's, they don't smell. They're basically silent, um, and they're very healthy. You can't get sick from that sort of a house. So that's where we're headed. Fix up an old house, make it tight, insulate it, and ventilate it. And then everyone's happy. This building took seven years to pay back. One of my customers, Jenny Thorne, her house, 2.8 years. The more money you spend, there's diminishing or slower returns. So not everyone's going to get the magic. I pay X and I get X back immediately. But the it's the only thing you can do that will pay you back. New kitchen won't pay you back. New bathroom won't pay you back. This type of work pays you back. This house demonstrated it. And um, it was as simple as um, foaming the base, the crawl space, and I have the hatch open and people can look, putting plastic down. And foam is not the greatest product in the world environmentally. There's some debate around whether it's even worth it. But I think if, so long as Efficiency Vermont still um, calls it a good measure, then the um, pluses outweigh the minuses. So we foamed the basement. The walls had no insulation in them at all. And I knew that by thermal scanning the walls. It was a wake-up call when I took that class. On the inside, these walls were blue. I walked outside, the walls were red in the wintertime. <laughs> It's the opposite of what you want, right? So we had no insulation in the, in the, the floor insulation didn't do anything. So we insulated the perimeter of the basement, then packed the walls. Then the guy had put some insulation up there. So we air sealed it, which is foam and caulk, then added more insulation. So we probably have this much up there now, like R70. Um, it all works in concert. It's all insulated, it's all air sealed. That's the only way this building ever would have been good. If I had put new windows in, nothing would have happened, except I would have been way poorer. So people say windows are the problem. They're like 7% of your problem with about a 100 year payback. So insulating, air sealing, that's the answer. It doesn't cost all the money in the world. If you're poor, there's a program called um, NITO, which will do it for free. If you're middle income, you can pay for it out of your own money and it will pay you back. Or you can borrow money cheap from Opportunities Credit or VSECU, low interest. And if you have the wherewithal and you're just sitting on your money and your house leaks, 
My new thing is, we're running out of time, shame on you. You should fix your house, because it's the right thing to do. That's just my personal opinion. So I'm walking my talk, I did this, working on her house, working on all our neighbors' houses. It's a good thing. So support your energy committee, look around, see if people are getting the word out, and if they are or aren't, you know, let them know programs are available and they too could enjoy a more comfortable house that's durable and healthy. If you've got an existing wall like this, which is obviously really gorgeous, are you gonna are you gonna add a shell to the outside for more insulation or will you just try to fill it with as much as you already So <clears throat> good question. Vermont Residential Energy Code actually dictates that your cavities need to be filled as much as possible. So on an old house, you're never going to go and make it like net zero, German standard, you know, R35 or 40 walls. Um, but you can fill up what you have. This was tricky because you have to drill holes. And I'm, I'm like, well, if I drill them from the inside, then you won't see them from the outside. But that's going to be ugly, and I'll never, it'll never, It'll never be any good because I'll always see the hole. So then I'm like, well, I'll drill them from the outside. Then I'm like, well, that's going to be ugly too. But I needed to do one side or the other. In this case, this building, and nobody except me has actually noticed this, never got clapboards put on. It was supposed to have clapboards put on due to the way it was built. So I'm like, well, I'll just drill the holes from the outside. So when you guys leave or whenever, you can walk around and look at all the holes I drilled. I drilled two holes for every bay, sometimes three holes. And that's how we dense packed it, by with chopped up newspaper blown in, such a way that it's three and a half pounds per foot. Dense packed. The difference between dense packing and just blown in cellulose is that dense packing is an air seal. Blown in cellulose is fluffy, it's not an air seal. So there, there you go, Kevin. Questions. You mentioned fans to bring in, or I guess you're exhaust. Right. Only. Um, that sounds counterproductive. Do they have a an air handling system that, well, you don't because your so, your replacement air is coming in through gas. If I had correct, so the strategy of bath fans and range hoods, or in my case, wall fans. Um, is the best of the worst. So you're right, whereby it relies on makeup air through cracks and gaps, which this house will, or building will never be net zero, zero tight, no air movement. The doors, it's all wood joints. So it's the best I could do at the time, knowing now. <coughs> Knowing now, maybe I would have put in a, a balanced ventilation system because they're easy and they're cheap, as it turns out, on a retrofit if the house is open floor pan like this. But I didn't know about it at the time. So I did the best that I could do. And to me, that's all I can do. In, in Germany, they're heating their intake air. I mean... So the Germans are like on the, the forefront of this weatherization, high-performance home stuff. And we just put a system in at her house where it's a heat recovery ventilator. So it goes through this box and the air never touches each other but it goes through this box where it crosses over so it sucks some air it, the it, incoming cold air is conditioned with the outgoing hot air right so that's where it's a heat recovery it's ventilator yeah. that's a really good system um, new houses have them they're no brainer because you can put drop ceilings in and run all your piping and it makes sense but here you wouldn't want to yeah. do that. You wouldn't want to ruin this. With pipes and stuff. So it just, it's, just it's the best of a bad situation. And there's a penalty. A lot of people are like, well, I walked by my range hood. 
which you really need, in the winter time, and cold air is coming out of it, that's an energy penalty. There's nothing you can do. I mean, there's flappers and dampers and stuff. None of it really works well. So, if it's really cold and it's back drafting, then I put the fan on. So it's not perfect, but the alternative is bad air, which is way worse. Yeah. What about sealing gaps in an old place and finding those gaps? Uh, <laughs> these are tongue and groove boards. Every one of them leak. If I wanted to get depressed in the wintertime, I'd, I'd scan the walls again. I mean, it, it just... That's why this house will never be I'm just zero. From a moisture standpoint. So moisture, you want to get rid of moisture point source. So bath fans on humidistats. And then people are like, well, in the wintertime, it's really dry. So you have to play games and find some situation that works for you. There's no silver bullet on old houses. Um, unless you went like Anna did and went through it thoroughly, like gutted it all. Okay. That way you can get to and the do, problem. And do your blower door. Yeah. Out what makes sure you got it. Right. Because I've heard of cases where you, know, you, you do the insulation, you do a, a, what you think is a good job of air sealing, but it's not good enough. And then that, mo that air brings that moisture to the outer layers and then you get mold. Oh, and rot. I've made a fortune on houses like that. In Mass, they all rotted out around windows and corner ports. We had no idea why. Customers would be like, Mark, why? And I'd be like, ooh, I have no idea. And nobody I know has any idea. Until this guy, Joe Stiebrek, wacky Canadian, um, came up with the solutions and the understanding and the constant experimentation. And you got to be happy, you got to be really invested in not knowing, and you got to be invested in being proved wrong, and you got to be invested in failure. Those are my like, three favorite teachers. Because as carpenters and builders, you want to be right, and you know it all, and you've been doing it forever, and your people have. And, and the air ceiling is no. on the inside shell versus... So the new houses, we'll test them, and... Dylan had a, his house is a good example last week. He'll test them before, well, they'll plywood them and tape them, and they'll test them with the blower door. Let's fix the leaks then, right? And then they'll put in all the mechanicals and punch all the holes, and they'll test them again. Then they'll insulate them, and they'll test them again. So the last step is when you get your sheetrock up and your finished trim up, um, you'll test it for the final time. So you had opportunities all the way through to catch the air leaks. Because it's really that simple. If your house doesn't leak air, then all of the heat that you paid for will stay in your house. And then back to the ventilation thing. There's a new product called Aero Barrier, which we're following, we're watching. And the guy will come and set up this thing with the blower door and it squirts out little fine mist of stuff that goes in the cracks and gaps. Pretty cool notion, pretty well tested out. It's not a silver bullet either because you can look at the stuff, right? You can see it. But that's a pretty cool system for either new construction or older houses where you really want to air seal it. And dramatic results with that aero barrier air barrier. So you do that before you paint your finish whatever? We could set it up in your house, my house, or any of the houses. It's just that wherever the cracks and gaps were, you're going to see these little pink fuzzy bits of stuff. So then you touch up? Touch up, or I don't know what you do. It's not like pink fuzzy everywhere. It's, just it's only, only where there are cracks and gaps. They, they have to cover all the, all the horizontal surfaces. If it's in a house that's already finished, they cover the horizontal surfaces because when it settles, it'll make it sticky. Um, in, in an old or a new, brand new house where you're at the construction phase, you um, just cover things like the edges of the parts of the door, you know, that are flat, or the sills of the window, or but other than otherwise, um, it only sticks to the surface. It only settles down to the floor and down to the horizontal surface. So 
And, and uh, the guy who did that, um, John Unger Murphy, he, I think he was saying it's like $1,200 per house. So yeah. it's not a ton of money. It's probably a good solution for a lot of people. So I'm, I'm going to have an energy tour on May 11th. And, and what's your it's, name? It's Matt Moody. Matt Moody. And it's a brand new house. Um, they didn't go crazy with their energy detailing, but they did do aero barrier, and so it was. We, we got to test it out, and it was the first house John Unger Murphy did. Okay. Um, so it was a very interesting experiment, and I was lucky that they decided to go ahead and try it, and so I got to see uh, some of the results from that. So it was quite impressive. There's a lot of smart people um, in this room, and there's a lot of smart people out and about, so it's your opportunity to, to reach out and learn as much as you can possibly learn because we all share the planet. And we all share the need to have some sort of shelter and we all share the desire to, to be more comfortable in our shelter. So it's, um, it's a growth industry. We've only been at this for like 20 or 25 years. Um, we're constantly learning, and I mentioned Joe Stebrack, he was my, one of my teachers, completely invested in failure. So there's a lot to be learned here. There's no single simple solution, but if we look and we learn and experiment, um, we're getting to the place where it's all sort of coming together. Pretty exciting. There's also a great opportunity for anybody in this room to invent something really cool and buy your own island because it all hasn't been invented. Like, if you wanted to buy your own island, tell me how I can make bath fans not backdraft. Like, really not backdraft. And then I'd put that little component in, and then I wouldn't get the question of why is my, I walk past, and I got the same thing, my bath fan's cold. One of my customers, I put the, the fan in the wall and he hate, his wife hated it, so she cut up a pizza box and put the pizza box over it. That was her solution. <laughs> and then another customer who I, I love, I won't mention his name, local good townsperson, he's like, Mark, should I turn on my HRV? Heat recovery ventilator? I'm like, why wouldn't you? He's like, because it makes noises and it uses energy. I said, just turn it on and see how smells. I see how it feels with it on. So, yeah. Mark, it's uh, gotten warmer in here. <laughs> A lot of 98.6. I'm in my socks and this, this floor is relatively warm. Um, you did put the pink insulation in the floor. You said that wasn't good enough. So, what? Uh, why was it important to do the spray foam in the basement? And So, How can I say this? I'm, the older I get, the less I'm invested in being politically correct. Foam plastic is in everything. A lot of people hate on foam plastic. When we put the fiberglass in the floor and nothing happened, it happened because there was no air barrier, there's no air seal. It's just foam. If you look at Fiberglass in walls, when it's black, I never knew this. I'm like, why did it get black? It got black because it's an air filter. The furnace going, the wood stove going, it's making air that's hot, it goes up, it's stack effect. So fiberglass is just a filter, so that didn't do anything. So the foam plastic, as it turns out, sticks to everything. And it's high R value, seven per inch. So when I foamed the perimeter, the stones, and I'd like everyone who, who feels up to it to look in my crawl space, I shot the, all the stone wall foundation with foam plastic. I had some guy do it. As soon as I put the foam plastic in the walls, the air stopped moving. It became like a beer cooler, which is what we all want our houses to sit on. Nothing else would work. 
So I didn't put foam plastic in the walls because we could dense pack that with a friendly um, recycled content newspaper. I didn't put foam plastic in the attic because I could do that with cellulose. But I did use the foam plastic where only foam plastic would work, which is the crawl space or the basement. And yeah, the blowing agent's awful. But I think it's better to fix up the house and degrade the environment a little bit. But I don't know. You want to buy the nicest island that's even nicer than Necker Island, right? Um, come up with something like foam plastic that you can shoot against foundations that's environmentally friendly, that you could eat. Because we'd all like to be able to eat these products. And that would be good, right? But no, we're not there yet. Isn't, isn't there hemp insulation? Um, I don't know if there is or there isn't. If I could see hemp being good, a lot of natural stuff's good. Wool, hemp, newspaper, dungarees. But they're susceptible to moisture. They're not an air seal. Um, so you have to go to great extent to try and make that stuff not fail. That's why fiberglass is cool, because it drains water and doesn't make mold or mildew. Um, I used to think straw bale houses were stupid. I'm not. I think straw bale houses are probably like perfect now. If you have them up on a high foundation with big overhangs so they don't get wet and good ventilation, because then we're natural, right? We're renewable. Um, a huge R value, but are we all going to live in straw bale houses? I don't think so. I just not going to. Am I going to retrofit your house with straw? So if you drive around and you see trailers and old farmhouses, there's a reason they banked them up with straw and then put plastic up or shoveled snow. It's the same thing, but that doesn't last. So foam plastic is the answer. So you have, have the R values that they're recommending come down then? Because I was seeing 60, 45, and 30 or something. This year at the Better Building by Design, and if you're in this room on this tour, there's some part of you that's an energy geek, and that's a good thing. Um, if you go to Better Building by Design, it's a show in, in uh, Burlington every year. They, that's what they, they sprung on us this year. And I, you get building scientists fighting each other with contrary, right? It's so great. So this year it was like, if we air seal the heck out of these houses, we don't need German standards of insulation, which to me is like, wow, that is so cool. Because last year and for the last 20 years, we're like, oh, it has to be huge insulating values. But there's diminishing returns. So yeah, they're finding out that air sealing, um, you don't need the German Robusto standards of insulation. So what are they recommending now? Do they have a number to it yet, or are they just saying you, not you want to get, you want to listen to building scientists argue, go to a bar <laughs> on one of these shows, and they'll be at the bar okay. having these crazy conversations. Um, but we're all open. That's the thing, and um, it's we're it's in flux. So I don't know what they are. I don't even think they know. I don't even Joe Stebrook doesn't know. Right? And he'll be the first person to tell you. And I use him because the government pays him to do studies. Since he does, those studies become our studies. So we get a really smart person to tell us every cool thing they know um, for free. Right? So Building Science Corp. If you're a geek, you want a deep dive. There's another cool guy up here, Martin Holiday, Green Building Advisor, super geek. Um, Question? No. I have a quick one. Sure. You said at one point two dogs, or a one dog is two dog. Two one dog's two people. Tell tell me about that. Uh, what did you mean by that? So, when I walk into a building, I love my job. I love walking into people's houses. Very respectful. But I'll walk in, and it'll like smell, or it'll be hot, or it'll be a stuffy, and I'll be like, damn it, they got dogs, and I'm like, how many people live here? So one house I did an audit on, it was just stuffy and awful. And I got to be really respectful. But I'm like, how many people live here? She's like, six. I'm like, how many dogs? She's like, five. 
I'm like, oh my God, because a dog pants and breathes really heavy. So your little dogs, they might be one human, <laughs> but they're still a human. So um, <laughs> our bigger dogs, definitely two. And the reason it matters is because of, um, you know, higher, every higher body temp, higher body temp um, carbon dioxide. I went to this energy fair that Kevin's team sponsored and there's this carbon dioxide meter they had. And what Bruce, he was one of my teachers, said is if you're gonna go for a job interview, make it in the morning where the carbon dioxide level in the building's low, you'll be smarter, right? Because we get dumber with carbon dioxide building up. Um, Polaroid, remember Polaroid? They were like cutting edge. They thought in Massachusetts they would save money by turning their ventilation systems down. And what they found out is people were getting sick, calling in sick and being dumb and lethargic at work. So they cranked the ventilation back up. People got smarter again. So we got a lot of people and a lot of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. means everyone's getting a little sleepier. When you're in school, remember you were like, and it wasn't because maybe you stayed up late, it was because you were running out of O2 in the room. So when I taught outdoor survival and stuff, we'd make sure classroom, classroom, and then boom, get people outside, fresh air, classroom, classroom, fresh air outside. It's the cops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my house, Mark, which you have some familiarity with, um, I have a moisture problem in the bathroom and the bedroom in the winter when I shut the door to the bedroom, which I do to keep the light out and, you know, the, the bathroom's right next to the bedroom. I shut that door in the winter and there'll be moisture and... Where are your dogs? Nervous. Where else would they be? So we got one or two humans, one or two, two, one or two dogs, and so... And it, a pretty tight house. And a pretty tight house, and so we talked about this it comes up every year at the show. The bedroom, people go into the bedroom, close the door, a lot of people do, with their dogs and their partners. So no wonder condensate, exhalation, carbon dioxide. Keep the door open. You, you should mention, you it's mentioned a light issue week. for me. But. What's that? Uh, you mentioned last week the, uh, there's a study where the bedroom door was shut and the, and the carbon dioxide levels were really high and, and you were, you know, you just kind of touched on that, but there's a great study that you were mentioning last week at Dylan's place where the, you know, the, you kind of don't ever want to have your door shut again after you see how bad the air is by being shut in your bedroom. So the tighter the house, so if we all lived in old farmhouses and it was 73 degrees, we wouldn't be here, nobody would care and you'd be healthy but that's because they moved a lot of air, natural ventilation. It matters when, like your house, a lot of attempts were made to make it tight. Um, the tighter, the more imperative ventilation becomes. So would I use a small air exchange thing in that end of the house? You, it doesn't really work like is. that. Because yeah. it's, it used to be like houses were like Model T's now they're more like Priuses or Teslas. They're complex and they're high performance. So it's really everything. So when I walk in to do an audit, I'm looking at the walls, the ceiling and the floor. That's, that's the house. So what happens in one room happens in all the rooms. So you wouldn't just ventilate one room. You'd want the whole house to have, it's this organism that's constrained by the walls and the floors and the ceiling, all of that air needs to be conditioned. I, mean, I get that in theory, but in fact... Open a window. Open a window. They do make those single room air exchangers if you have a more like open floor plan. Right. So but she, if you want to deal with one bad spot. Yeah, but then I'd be like, what about the rest of my house? Yeah. How about the Lunos fans? So... <sighs> You want to buy your island, come up with a better system. And you'll be hard pressed to get better than heat recovery ventilation or energy recovery ventilator. But now they're sticking this thing called a serve in where they got a heat pump in the mix and they're, it's 
It's all balanced and conditioned. The Lunos is a little wall fan that has a ceramic core that's doing the same thing. It's constantly dumping and another one's bringing fresh air in. That's a good system, but it's teeny and they're in pairs. And to me, that's uh, not as preferable as having a whole house system. But you might be able to stick a couple of Lunoses in your bedroom. There's an answer. I mean, the only issue is in the bedroom because of what we're describing. So then stick in a couple of Lunoses. They need to be wired together. They need to be able to communicate <clears throat> through wires. And again, maybe someday they'll be all like Bluetooth or whatever and talk without any of that. But in the meantime, Lunos might do it for you. Cause, or some single room system. Mm -hmm. But I look at the whole house as a whole. So to me, I want to do the whole house. Is there any kind of cheap CO2 monitor sensor? Yeah. Um, Google it. Okay. And my guess is, um, yeah, Efficiency Vermont had this really slick little thing. I think it was $300. So you want carbon monoxide detection, you should have carbon dioxide detection, you know, LP gas detection, photoelectric, um, and um, what's the other one? Photoelectric and ionization, fire detection. So yeah, monitoring your house is important. Yeah, battery operated, this thing. The, new, the new ones, so batteries, the bane of my existence, they go dead and you're supposed to change them every six months or a year. So new smoke detectors are lifetime or 10 years sealed. You can't change batteries. So that's where they're headed and that's the problem with battery stuff is. But those batteries gonna last 10 years? I bought one of those and it lasted about a year. I would, no, six months is what they're saying now. I mean, we don't have any electric on at night, so. Um, batteries. Change them regularly. But I was going to say the Luno span is really neat uh, in my mind because I, I've lived off the for 20 years, and you can run a Luno span off of a off of a I would have DC you know battery bank. And so if you have to have the power off at night, you could run it directly yeah, off well, your yeah, batteries. Yeah, we have some DC, so if you could connect it to DC, that's yeah. on. But then we turn the AC off at night. Right. Alternating current, not the air conditioning. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to talk more about somebody who has Lunos fans, um, Anna Keeler from the Greensboro Energy Committee has uh, some in her house. So, do you want to speak to your Lunoses? Do you have any questions? <laughs> Particular questions? I don't yeah. know if like, enough about them to even ask. So uh, good question, it's, so. On the inside, it's basically just a little um, yeah. white square with um, a sound dampening, like, it's probably, I don't know, foam. And, um, and it's got three settings, and I, I do believe they make single room, but they also make, um, if you have a larger space, they have one on either side of the space, and they talk back and forth to each other. Um, and in my opinion so far I, I feel like the heat recovery is supposed to only go down to negative 10 I believe but I don't really feel it until negative 20 negative 30 but then everything's cold <laughs> at that point so I don't know if it's really the fans or it's just stuff freezes up and this this placement in the room that I mean do, you, do they sit high do yeah they, they sit high mm -hmm. um, and and they need to be wired together yeah if, if you have if you have the, the pair. Okay. Um, the other thing, I, like I hadn't ever lived in a well insulated house before, um, so you need fans in your windows if you get to, to the point where you're going to turn them off. Like the, basically the, if you open a window in my house, unless there's wind, the, the air does not flow in and out. Um, so that's, so I don't know how. cross ventilation windows or? Yep, and I have, I have a narrow house, but because it's so tight, um, like, you know, at night when the wind drops, um, I'll wake up sometimes and be like, oh, I should have left them on because it feels stuffy. I have a dog. She can't. She's got bad breath. Why do they need to talk to each other? 
Uh, because you have a, if you have a larger space, um, you have two, well, one, and one's one going in and one's blowing okay, out, and so it, one it, yeah, yeah okay. it, it's for the air pressure. So you don't always need two if one's in, one's out. No, so you have one okay. pulling air in, right, and pushing air out, and then they switch. Um, mm -hmm. And there's the, a coil that's heating the air and mm -hmm. cooling. Pre, yeah. Right, okay. Well, not cooling, but yeah, mm -hmm. um, so that you have some heat recovery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, and they're uh, they're less noise than my refrigerator, but I have an old refrigerator. <laughs> well, that's another that's issue. Yeah. They're they're pretty quiet, I'd say. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I I went to your house and talked to you about them, yep. and then I went to um, concerning Margaret uh, over in in Crass, well, maybe yeah, in Crassbury, and she, and she had the same thing, and they're pretty quiet, mm -hmm. I'd say. Especially when they're on low, you can barely hear them. Yeah. But I mean, I wouldn't put it right over your head. But if if you don't have a tiny bedroom, you probably yeah, it's less than like a manual fan. Mm -hmm. So feel free to walk around and look. Um, I also have uh, DIY pictures that Isa Ori um, did, and the, um, there's a rebate going on where if you do three or four air sealing things, you can get a hundred bucks back on your uh, materials. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, I have the information over here in the box. Mm -hmm.